So thank you so much for the chance to be here. Thanks to Professor Caramello and all the organizers. I remember that um, there was a conference, I don't remember, in 1990 that I studied the proceedings of. And then in 2000, there was a conference. Uh, I was here, Peter Fried was talking. And I was thinking that here's a demigod, you know, Peter Fried. We use the special edge joint functional theory all the time. Wow, it's their life. So I guess a lot of you had the same feeling with Professor Olin Kahn. And let me just make it sure that, uh, make it clear that, you know, cohomology is not going to reach the soaring heights of, of Kahn's lecture. This is going to be a very pedestrian cohomology, like old fashioned sheaf cohomology. In fact, my background, if you like, my bias is algebraic topology. So a lot of these intuitions are generated by spaces and by simplicial sets. These are the basic invariants, so to say, developed in chronological order. Cohomology is even a ring as opposed to just homology, which is a kind of coring. Which of these generalize to toposes, and why should they even generalize? Why is it that you are interested in generalizing? And uh, let me show you something that I found I think is appropriate maybe at this stage because we are in the basilica. So this is a medieval view of the cosmos, right? These are the celestial spheres labeled by the planets. And then this is the center. The center is paradise, of course. And this is my slightly updated version. So <clears throat> I'd actually like to spend some time thinking about this diagram and what exactly is going on there. So topoi, I just once you know, wanted to write it topoi. So topoi is the category of rotating toposes and geometric morphisms. And there are lots and lots and lots of interesting categories of structured objects that you can very naturally, whatever that means, send by a pseudo functor, but I'm just going to say by a functor, into topoi. If you have a category, take pre sheaves on it. Stacks, exceedingly complicated objects, in some sense even more rich you know, than a topos. But when it comes to computing cohomology or anything, you put a chart on it, and you basically put a rotendic topology on it, and it becomes a topos. Profinite groups take equivariant sets. Simple show sets is a topos, but if you have a simple show set, take its category of elements, take pre sheaves on it. You have a Boolean valued model of the offset theory, take sets and take true functions in it, and that's kind of topos. Locally groupoid, it's a very unlikely sounding concept, but you can take equivariant sets on it in the suitable sense, as again, that's a topos. Or befolds, these are like manifolds, you know, with very good singularities locally, quotient by final group. Schemes, zillions and zillions of interesting ways in which you can associate a site to a scheme. Take sheaves on it, topological spaces are old friends, locales. If you have a single topos, take an object and take E over X. So something that's an object of a topos is at the same time also a topos of a sort. And this you know, confusion is really you know, something that's a theme, a running theme of SGA4. If you have a theory, you take its classifying topos, sites, take sheaves on it. Lots and lots of items missing here, and lots and lots of functors going across a lot of data. Why is it that you are interested in it? And you can say a lot of things, like you know, any time you have something, you want to represent it. You represent a group by a permutation group, by sets. You represent an algebraic group by linear representation. You represent a structured object by something that's even more structured and very beautiful, by a topos. And you can talk about like generalizing ideas like I will from topological spaces all the way to toposes so that everything in the universe has that property. But I wanted to say something else that hasn't come up, I think, in this conference quite as often as it, as it could have, which is that, uh, you know, these categories are very different. The objects are kind of incomparable. But once you send them to the center of the universe, they become comparable, and sometimes this is useful. Let me give you an example of this type from your first algebraic geometry, no, algebraic topology, sorry. Algebraic topology course. You have um, an abstract. Sorry, if you, can't, if you can't read this, stop me. You have an abstract, simply short complex. This is basically like a finite set with extra data, a distinguished set of subsets, such that the subset of a subset is a subset. You have this geometric realization. It's a topological space. 
You have simplicial cohomology groups here. Defined in a purely combinatorial manner. It's a chain complex, a co chain complex, purely finitary. You have singular cohomology groups here, which are defined in a really very set theoretical way. So, singular cohomology taking all the singular co chains. And there's a natural map here, because if you have a singular co chain, then you can evaluate it on any kind of singular simplex. So you can evaluate it on these you know, big geometric simplices. So there's a map going this way. And this turns out to be an isomorphism. But you know, this is hard to prove. You need simplicial approximation. Poincaré didn't prove this, couldn't prove it. Brouwer did for the first time. Because it's an isomorphism, there's a map going back, but that's not canonical. It's hard to construct. It's like deformations of co-chains. Think about the fundamental group. So this is the base point. You need to choose a base point. The fundamental group of a, of a combinatorial object, like an abstract simplicial complex, is defined by generators and relations. It's purely algebraic, purely finitary. There's a fundamental group here, and it's defined by a path using the continuum using topology. If you have any kind of, you know, this kind of, you know, purely combinatorial path, you can take its geometric realization, it becomes a topological path, you have a natural map this way. And this too is an isomorphism. But this map going back is not canonical. It's very hard to construct because you need to deform on the skeleton. You can do so using obstruction theory, but it's not canonical. So I have a question. This is a geometric object, sort of. This is a geometric object, sort of. The associated invariants are isomorphic. There must be a reason for this. There must be a comparison map. I'm not saying that they are homeomorphic or anything, but there must be a comparison map <coughs> inducing these isomorphisms. And you're guessing that the comparison map must be going this way. But what is it? And the best answer, in fact, in some ways, the only answer I can give at this point is that you need to blow up both of them into tropos. This becomes a pre-shift topos. I was going to leave it a big black box, and then here you take sheaves on this topological space. Very different toposes, but there is a geometric morphism this way. Yes? So No, anything like this has a geometric realization. Any abstract, just a sec, just a sec. Any abstract, simply sure, complex has a geometric realization. No, any abstract, simply sure, complex has a geometric realization. This is a functor, but there's no compact, it's a functor, right? So, but here you have a morphism, it's a geometric morphism. This isomorphism between the topos cohomology groups and this is canonical. This is canonical, and you can go across. And let me give you another example. Sorry for this aside, but I just felt that I had to say it at some point. And you have to give me some time to actually make some room here, which is even more complicated, but to me even more compelling. And this is Mike Artin's comparison theorem between et al. complex analytic cohomology with finite or you know, constructible coefficients. So. Let me just look at the most basic case, you know. You can look at fiber versions of this, a lot of it. This is a scheme, let's just say it's smooth over the complexes. And then you can look at its C points, becomes an analytic variety. Look at the usual topology. Any kind of cohomology theory here works. And these two are isomorphic, and much more is true, of course. But it's very hard to actually make any kind of direct comparison, any kind of direct map between the left hand and the right hand sides. So Mike Artin's ingenious solution is that this is a particular site, this is a particular site, and there is yet another site. Let me just call it complex et al. There are other ways of proving the theorem. There are site morphisms here. 
they become toposmorphisms. And these are both cohomology isomorphisms finally using this map. So you put something in the center, and two incomparable things become comparable. So the message which I wanted to send, I guess, is that if you have apples and oranges, then turn your apple into a topos, turn your orange into a topos, and if they still don't compare, put a topos in between, and then they will. And at the end of this talk, I will give you an example of an apple and an orange that I don't know how to compare, except by blowing them up all the way to toposes. So, just one more thing about this diagram. The reason I defer to it is that I wanted to ask some question from members of the audience who might be able to answer me, hopefully after my talk. Oops. You can ask a lot of questions about those functors. Are they faithful? For what do they do to call limits? Limits? What happens to the size of objects and everything? But something that's especially fascinating to me is the fact that sometimes those functors are sort of universal, that every topos can be expressed in terms of them, and in fact the entire category of topoi can be expressed as by localization of a category. I mean, take a class of morphisms, invert them formally, just like in the derived category. So if you go back here, sites are universal. And basically, SGA4, I mean, not in these terms, but describes topoi as a localization of the category of sites. Locally groupoids are universal. Any topos is equivariant sets in a locally groupoid. And you know, I think it was pointed out yesterday that there's a description of topoi, which is very strange, even as a two category, in terms of locally groupoids. And then, of course, any topos is the classifying topos of a geometric theory. What is a morphism of theories? So if you listen to category theorists, then a morphism of theories is a functor between the syntactic categories. And I sort of like it, and I sort of don't like it, because it's a semantic notion. It's an infinite amount of information to give a morphism of that type. If you listen to classical logicians, you know, model theorists, for them, a morphism of theories is an interpretation of one theory in another, or a definition, these are slightly different, of one theory in another. A purely syntactic device, every function symbol becomes interpreted by formula, every sort by formula. If you want to make your life harder, then you interpret sorts by definable objects, modulo definable equivalence relations, and functions by things which are definable and commute with them. I don't know a description of toposes as a localization of the category of geometric theories and syntactic data. By syntactic, I mean the classical logician's definition of embedding or interpreting one theory in another. And then here's another challenge to people who like to think about two categories in a very mild way. So the source categories, I mean, sometimes there are two categories. But you typically don't think of topological spaces as a two category. Homotopies don't make it a two category. You typically don't think of schemes as a two category. You almost never think of the category of theories as a two category. But the target is a two category, which means that there has to be something here in the domain that corresponds to natural transformations. What is it? Are we overlooking something? And the answer is yes, and you know, in some cases I know the answer, in others I don't, so you may have some fun with it. Yeah? Yeah, and I should have said pseudo functor, and I should have said weighted, calling it, and all that, and I don't want to. Sorry. Uh, look, so as I said, I really wanted to start with something very, very simple, very picturesque. And, you know, for all of you, knowledgeable enough. It's going to be so boring for a long time, but then I hope to put some twist on it that might be new to some of you. So you've seen these pictures lots and lots of times, to like the boundary of a cylinder projecting down on the circle, and the boundary of the Möbius strip projecting down on the circle. I just wanted to make sure that I don't think of these pictures as embedded in three-dimensional space. So this is why I put this, you know, purely set, Ooh purely set theoretical description, purely topological description here. So this is the circle that you wrap up into a real circle, 
And here you have two copies of the interval such that the endpoints are glued compatibly. And then here you have two copies of the interval such that the endpoints are glued across. And this is how you get you know, this twisted circle. And so these two are not isomorphic in topological spaces over the circle. In fact, they are just not isomorphic. They are not homeomorphic. If you twist it lots and lots of times, depending on what you mean by the same, you may get the same picture, you may get different pictures. So once again, as embedded links in three-dimensional space, these are sometimes different, distinguished by the linking number. But if you think of them as just abstract topological spaces over the base, then there's only two of them. So why is it that there's only two of them? What does this have to do with the circle? What does this have to do with the fact that the fibers have a, a two element? And so, as you all know, what's special about these spaces is that in the neighborhood of any point, the, any point has a neighborhood over which you have two disjoint homeomorphic copies of that neighborhood, which means that together these neighborhoods give you a cover of the topos. So here you have, in fact, an object in both cases that's locally isomorphic to the two-point constant object. So a little gamma is my notation, once again, apologies for the global sections functor, and a little gamma, upper star, which I'm going to omit here and there, is just the constant sheaves. In this case, on these two things that I denoted by zero and one. And once again, please excuse this, excuse, I'm sorry, excuse this notation. It's just temporary for the time being, just a nickname. We are going to see the real thing very, very soon. What I wanted to do is just some, have some fun. Is there a way to understand this concept more concretely when you specialize it to toposes of a special type? And the ones which are easiest to play with are the pre-shift toposes. You just, you know, do what you have to do that, you know, over every object you have two points, and then these two points must go to each other in some way, and that's the same thing as a functor. It's a functor into Zima 2 and the isomorphisms of these are the same thing as isomorphism types. And then if you think about this a bit further, because the target here is a group, So this is my favorite way to think about the fundamental groupoid. It's, it's a canonical, it's got a universal mapping property in the category of small categories as opposed to in topological spaces. And so this is the same thing as homomorphisms from the fundamental groupoid into a coefficient group. And H1 is just isomorphism types of these. And the fundamental group here comes up like completely spontaneously. I'd like to play the same game, exactly the same game, but now in topological spaces, and all of a sudden you get a very different feeling for the same thing. And this is, I think, the beauty of, uh, of topos theory. So let's say that you specialize the same question to spatial topos. This is the first description. Let me just give you a cartoon as well. So you have some kind of open cover of your topological space. doesn't need to be locally finite. Over this chunk, you have two sheets, and I'm going to label them 0 and 1. Over this chunk, you have two sheets. I'm going to label them 0 and 1. They could have other labels, and similarly there. You know that secretly, there should just be two points over each point, so you have to identify the sheet somehow, but in such a way that you can never identify two elements that are in the same family. So you have to make some kind of bijection here, and then maybe some kind of bijection here. And these bijections have to be compatible, such that when you quotient out with all of them, you still end up with one sheet, 
this one sheet may be twisted overall. And of course, this has to be continuous on the base, and it has to be well-defined. And just think about what it means, what it means to create such an equivalent insulation. And this comes, if you want to do it locally, con constantly, from introducing this kind of you know, twist over all the double intersections in such a way that they are consistent over the triple intersections. And you get exactly what are usually called, what are called, <laughs> co cycle conditions. In fact, what are co cycle conditions? And if you are able to do this successfully, then you have glued several parallel sheets into a single continuous double sheet. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to this cartoon, I labeled everything 0 and 1 to make sure that within the same family you can distinguish the two sheets and that I have an easy time referring to the sheets. Here's another cartoon. This is an open U sub i. You have a sheet over it, and this is called pi, and this is called e. And then here's another open, and there's a sheet over it, and this is called Jim, and this is called Jack. And I want to identify e and pi with Jim and Jack in such a way that Jim and Jack are always separate, and e and pi are always separate, and that overall, you still have just two sheets once you do all the identifications. But I didn't want to introduce so many names. So this is why I call this completely arbitrarily. This zero has nothing to do with this zero. This one has nothing to do with that one. I have an easier time referring to them. And you know, there are a lot of steps here. If you have something that's trivialized over an open cover, it can be trivialized over all the smaller open covers. You have to identify the ones that become isomorphic in the co-limit. And the description that you get is, once again, completely spontaneously, you are just following your geometric intuition, is the definition of what is called a first check cohomology group. And, you know, depending on your point of view, this could be just a set modular relation. Or if the coefficients are abelian, like they are here, it's actually a group, modulo group. I'm just thinking of this thing as a set for now. But you know, it's a wholly different looking recipe. I'd like to give you a third recipe now, and yes, there are more recipes coming. And this has to do with a simply sure way of describing the same amount of data. So you've all seen uh, the definition of the simply sure indexing category and what simply sure sets are. What may be the most unusual thing here, but it's very familiar to homotopy theorists, is what is called the horn. So this is the solid simply sure simplex. And then this is the horn. You take a solid simplex and you omit the interior, the top dimensional cell, and you omit one face. And this turns out to be something that's necessary to make the next definition. The notion of confibration, once again, is, is kind of you know, all over the place in homotopy theory. This is not fibrations like fibrations of categories. These are fibrations in the topological sense. Let me just give you one cartoon again, what this definition sort of means pictorially. So if this is a simplicial set, and this is a simplicial set, and you have a simplicial map between them, suppose you have an actual simplex here, and you know, because it's a simplex, its boundary is also there. And suppose that for some reason, nobody knows why, you are able to find part of the boundary of that simplex, every single face of the simplex except one, and I don't care about the center either, upstairs, in such a way that this projects down. Then the assumption is that you can fill in this horn, potentially non-uniquely. This is just like serf vibration. And then, which is very unusual that sometimes you can fill it in uniquely. And I insist that the picture is exactly like that. So the notion of confibration is a uh, simplicial or discrete version or analog of the notion of self-fibration. And if you want to play this you know, locally in simplicial sheaves, then you can describe it in the internal logic. Or you can just think about the object of horns inducing an epi to the object of N cells. It's a little bit involved thingy, and I apologize for that. The reason that I bring it up is that 
if you follow the previous recipe and you rewrite the same amount of data, all the gluing maps and everything, it doesn't seem likely, but it becomes simplicial homotopy theory. And the stages of the formula there exactly correspond to the stages of the previous construction. The co-limit is that co-limit. The fact that it's over homotopy classes of covers is exactly the same thing that the inclusion of two covers in different ways induces the same map. And these square brackets is always homotopy classes for me. So this is homotopy classes into the nerve, if you like, the classifying space of a group object. You can think of it as a discrete group. Co-skeleton, once again, is just the way that you can construct a canonically simplicial object from its zero cells, from just the ground floor. It's a certain kind of con extension. All right, it's an unlikely looking recipe, but it turns out to be useful. Seemingly has nothing to do with the previous ones. Now wait till you see the rest. So I, I don't know if the notion of Quillen model category came up in, in previous talks, it's something that's become essential with Wojewodzki's uh, theory of A1 local homotopy. Actually, Quillen was very much influenced by, by Vergie and by we, being near Grothendieck in the 1960s. And he just wanted to do the same thing for homotopy theory that derived categories and triangulated categories did for homological algebra. So instead of quasi-isomorphisms, you have weak equivalences which are relating objects that are homotopically indistinguishable. Instead of triangles, you have cofibration and fibration sequences. He wrote down axioms, Quillen wrote down axioms for, these are analogous to the axioms for triangulated categories, if that helps, that works in the non-additive setting as well, and called it a homotopy model category, meaning here you can do formal homotopy theory the same way that you can formally do homological algebra in a triangulated category. And then the description that I was aiming at, so this is just my notation for taking a category and formally inverting a class of morphisms. The fact that it's locally small category is a set theoretical statement, but you know it's got real depth. So if you know about derived categories, it's a lot of trouble to take the unbounded chain complexes and the derived category of those. In fact, Rotendi couldn't do it for a long time. In the 1980s, it was done. So this is some kind of you know, non-additive homological algebra. This recipe, once again, looks familiar if you are a homotopy theorist, that G torsors are the same thing as homotopy classes. Well, the terminal object here is for topospheric reasons into what is called an eilenberg maclean space of dimension one. This is just the same thing as the nerve of a group. The reason that I put it here is that you can get to this description reasonably easily from the previous one. Oops, sorry. So you know, yet another description, very different looking. Okay, so what is a torso? The reason that I bring up the next slide is just because if you open a textbook of algebraic geometry, chances are that you see this sort of definition of a torso, you know, which is completely fine. First of all, you want the coefficients to be an arbitrary sheaf of groups, to be acting on a set in a simply transitive way, on a sheaf of sets in a simply transitive way, so that over each object, over each local section, there's exactly one local group element that takes it from here to there. And the only place, the only place where the topology comes in is making sure that this action is not trivial, meaning there is actually something there, meaning that local sections actually exist, so it's a kind of non-emptiness condition. And you know the name pseudotorsor is not that usual, but De Young uses it. And then the most familiar description that you've all seen, I guess, in previous lectures is of course this one. So a G-torsor is an object with an equivariant action, and the coefficient is a group object in the topos, satisfying that it's got global support, locally everywhere, non-empty. So this little, the two arrows mean that it's actually epi. And this second line expresses that it's a simply transitive action. 
given any two elements, there's a unique group element that takes it from here to there. And it follows purely formal that is locally trivial. So, you know, because I put logic in the title, I felt obligated to actually write down some logical formulas. Now, these are the axioms that say exactly what they have to say. First of all, it's an E-valued flat P-shift, whatever that means. And secondly, if you just want to think of it in terms of sets, then this is how you would say it. T is non-empty, you know, there's something inside it. The identity element of the group acts as the identity, it's equivariant. I'm really thinking of G as a group, by the way. So there's also a group inverse. It's just not part of the notation. It's not just a monolith, really, it's a group. And then this says that if you have two elements of the set acted on, then there's a group element that takes it one to the other. And this last line says that different group elements never take the same element to the same target. So there's always a unique group element that takes it from one location to the other. You know, I want to pause here for a second, because this is a very funny first-order theory. I mean, it's not really first-order if the group is infinite, and this is an infinite disjunction. I really want to make sure that the elements of G become function symbols, so they are not variable. There's only one sort. And what makes this theory sort of funny, if you think about the set models of this theory, any model in set looks exactly the same, so any model in set must be a set, which is non-empty, there is something inside there, and then the elements of the group act on it, and you get everything exactly once, and you get the group action. And if you have two such models, and there's somebody here, it must go to some place, and this describes the entire homomorphism. Because if you have anybody else here, there's a group element, takes it there, you look at the image of the group element, it's well-defined, injective, subjective, it's got a bijective homomorphic inverse. So there's only one model in set, and any homomorphism of models is an isomorphism. I want to say this is unusual. Think about your favorite first-order theory. I know, piano arithmetic, sets, some universal algebra. Every single homomorphism of models is an isomorphism. I mean, how often does that happen? Because in first-order logic, if you have a model, you can always enlarge it using compactness. You can have an elementary embedding into a properly larger model. So for sure, that's not an isomorphism. And in fact, you can have a proper class of models. No, I just said compactness, and compactness is a property of first-order logic. If you want to say the same, if you want to do the same for infinity logics, you get into a lot of trouble. And for L infinity omega, the answer is unknown. For some smaller infinity logics like L omega 1 omega, you can get a single sentence which has a class of models, but sorry, a set of models, but nothing bigger than a certain size. But these are very hard questions, really. So I put a question here. And I'll be asking several questions during this, this talk, and some of them are rhetorical, and some of them are exercises, and some of them I myself don't know the answer to, and this is something that I don't know the answer to. It may be a hard question. For infinity logics, I think it's hard. For coherent or first-order logic, you may be able to use best definability and say that basically, other than torsors, there is no theory of this type. I want. Yeah, sorry. If it's just a set of models, yeah, you can do that. Whether everything is an isomorphism, every single homomorphism model is an isomorphism that must be con then they are constant. Yes, you can have constant families of this type, but I'm looking for something that's not constant, you know, where the category of models is a groupoid. Yeah, you can have constant and finite examples, any kind of finite category is axiomatizable. So for infinity logic, once again, is much harder. So anyway, I, d I can't know how to answer that question, but there's much, much weaker, which is that this property implies this property. And this is a very easy consequence of some very deep facts, if you like, you know, in accessible categories. So locally presentable categories are a 
variant on the notion of sheaf, if you like. It's a very good kind of reflective subcategory of the category of pre-sheaves. And the sketches are just like, you know, logic adapted to suitable categories. And this statement is that if you are so lucky that you have a category of models that's a groupoid, then that's automatically a small groupoid. So that seems to come out of nowhere, but it really comes out of the set theoretical assumptions of being locally presentable and the fact that it's axiomatizable by a sketch. So it all comes courtesy of this foundational work of Makai and Paré. This Makai is the same thing as Makai Rise, really one of the giants of, uh, of the intersection of classical model theory and the topos theory and category theory, and the notion of accessible category kind of loosens the set theoretical, it keeps the set theoretical foundations of toposes, but loosens the extra exactness requirements. It's a very robust uh, theory where you can make conclusions about small sets of objects being there and generating the entire category very easily. And this is just one of those, one of those cases where you can make it. But I somehow I find this corollary interesting. So if the category of geometric morphisms between two toposes is a groupoid, it's automatically a small groupoid. I somehow want to know more about this property. And once again, this is a very classical statement. It's the last description that I wanted to give of what first non-abelian cohomology is, is that the category of torsos is a category of geometric morphisms from a classifying topos, that's G sets, and non-abelian cohomology is isomorphism classes of these objects. This is all in SGA4, not exactly in these words, but the content is all there. I thought that at this point I wanted to have some fun and ask the audience to do something that I may or may not be able to do. And this is looking at torsors as torsors. Because so far we've really been talking about G torsors, where G had to be specified and you talk about G torsors. So that's a G torsor. But what is A torsor? Can you talk about A torsor in such a way that all the structure comes out of it? And the answer is yes. And I didn't realize this for a long, long time until I learned it not from where I should have learned it, but a different location. This is one way to think about a torsor. So this buyer, I believe, is the same thing as the same person <laughs> as the buyer of buyer sum of, of X groups. So a torsor is a set, non-empty, equipped with a ternary operation. And you know, it's not that often that you see ternary operations. And this operation has the mod set property, and it's got this awful looking set of identities. It's purely equational. Why is this a good thing? Where does it come from? It comes from reverse engineering, I guess, you know, what happens with G actions, simply transitive G actions. So there's a recipe from going from this kind of torsor to our torsors. First of all, any group G acting on itself becomes a buyer torsor when you interpret the triple operation this way. And I didn't want to write down this recipe. This is a wonderful monograph on Nori motifs and periods that uh, I happened to discover a description, and I'm sure it's elsewhere. The recipe for going from a buyer torsor to our kind of torsor is really very tricky. And the reason, if you think about it, is that the data is a non-empty set, and you are not allowed to use choice. But you end up with a group, and the group has a canonical unit. So how is it possible that you start with a non-empty set and you end up with a pointed set and you are not allowed to use choice? It's canonical. And so the answer is that if you square T, then any square has a canonical subset, which is the diagonal, and that diagonal becomes the unit. And it's exactly the same thing as when you pull a torsor back to itself, it becomes trivial. It's just saying the same thing in a slightly different way. But I love this recipe, and I like to ask the audience, people who like playing with this are more talented than me, to try to do the following exercise. Sorry? It should be true, it absolutely should be. This is why I call it an exercise, right? 
So what is it that makes it a little bit more challenging, depending on how you think of it? First of all, the classifying topos is very easy. This is a universal equation of theory, other than the non-emptiness. Non-emptiness is sort of harmless. It's a theory of P-shift type. This is, is almost autologous. I mean, you know what happens, and this is what happens. It's just a functor. It's induced by a functor between the indexing categories. The reason that this may be worth pondering is that I like to ask for a Morito equivalence, which is syntactic. So like I said earlier on, if you ask a logician, then two theories are equivalent if they are bi-interpretable. And this bi-interpretation has to be done by coherent sentences or coherently definable objects, modulo coherently definable, provably equivalence relations. You, I don't want to just say that the classifying toposes are equivalent. I like to have a syntactic description. And you have to bring in quotients. This is something where you really need an interpretation as opposed to a definition of a theory or another. But like I said, it's just a fun exercise. All right, so where are we? Here's what I like to do. What happens for the higher cohomology groups? Do we have analogs of these? And then secondly, maybe just a tiny little bit, but not too much, because I'm going to get probably you know, a lot of comments from Professor LaFrog, maybe say something about the fundamental group. So let me just say you know, something about the fundamental group, and then I'll be able to fill in the last column, and the, the excitement comes, really, when you think about the analog of this thing over there. It doesn't have a very nice analog. So a lot of people over the last 50 years have thought about the fundamental group of a topos, certainly starting with Rotendieck, and this is still the best definition other than it's profinite, and other than it needs a point, and other than it's a fundamental group and not a fundamental groupoid. So how is it that you can get rid of some of these? Once again, a lot of things. This is infinitary Galois theory in the sense of infinitely many sheeted coverings. It works very well for locally connected toposes. Artin and Maser approximated any locally connected topos, any locally connected site, but it works for toposes, by a pro-object in the homotopy category of simple short sets. So you have almost all of algebraic topology here. It turns out that you can imitate the path definition of the fundamental group because these toposes are exponentialable. Mordike is an elaboration of this. The localic fundamental group is really a groupoid. So this is interesting that there is a set of connected that is a set of connected components. I mean it's very non obvious that you can do that. You can do it in some cases. Kennison describes it as a bifiltered, bi weighted co limit. And then this recent preprint, I think, just rediscovers some of what was going on. I don't think that the authors knew it. This is about one-fourth of what's going on with the fundamental group. There's another slice of thought that thinks of the fundamental group as having to do with Galois theory. You just need to define what Galois theory is. And, you know, Grote and Dick wrote this long march through Galois theory. There's an entirely, not entirely separate, but there's a train of thought specializing to schemes that says that the fundamental group should be a group scheme, or it should be a pro-group pro -group scheme. And once again, it has very deep implications in algebraic geometry, slightly different direction from many of these. And then there's a fourth line of thought, if you like, that says that Tanaka theory and this thing are so analogous that there should be a common denominator there. It's very dangerous territory, and I don't want to enter this territory once again for fear of getting a lot of comments. I'm going to skip here. Let me just say that the wish list for a fundamental group is something like this. This is hard to do. I don't think it's been achieved yet. If you take away some of these requirements, yes. If you want to keep all of them, then no, I think. This is the hardest part. All topos is over a base topos, especially when the base topos is not sense. Seifert von Kampen, of course, Rotendig did that. A lot of versions exist in all of these theories. It ought to be compatible with the existing theories, and it ought to be a fundamental groupoid, something that Rotendig also emphasized. Of course, there are a lot of cases when it's a fundamental groupoid already. But like I said, I want to skip over this thing and think about the higher cohomology groups. Has this definition come up in previous lectures? I thought so. And so this is why I chose this as the subject of my lecture, even though it's ancient to some extent. I think it's very pretty, and I don't think it's quite so well known. 
So please excuse the square brackets, because I'm an algebraic topologist. Square brackets are homotopy classes for me. These are not internal home sets. And pi zero is the set of connected components, and this is the category of geometric morphisms. And so any category has a set of connected comp class of connected components, objects, modulo the morphisms. And here I emphasize that this really is a set. If E and F are Grothendieck topos, it's a set. It's the same kind of nonsense with accessible categories that you can do to say that you have a set valued invariant. And Joyal, I believe, is due to Joyal or to Wraith, called it natural homotopy. It's really like if, if I wanted to ask the audience to remember a single line of this talk, I really want it to be this line because it's something to be flayed, played with, it's something to be interesting. You know, set of connected components, it's really very boring. However, it's a topological invariant. If you have a category, it's got a set of connected components, you have a functor, connected components behave in a connected way, out of connected components you can create anything that you wanted to. Homotopy comes out of connected components in an interval. Homotopy groups come out of it. Cohomology groups out of it. This is the most basic algebraic topologic invariant that you may want to lift from your favorite ground, playground, to toposes, hence to elsewhere. I'm making a promise here, which is that several contravariant events will happen. I hope to keep this promise and actually show you. I'm not going to keep this promise and show where the algebraic structure comes from. It's analogous to how homotopy classes become homotopy groups and cohomology operations come into action. I have not thing to say about this bullet point, except I don't think people have played with this. So we have a theory and you want to understand your theory or its Morita equivalence class, and you test it in different universes. Maybe these are just Boolean valued models of set theory. But the test is really very, very simple. You are testing if the category of model stays connected, or if it doesn't, into how many connected components it falls into. We all know a very simple theory that has countably many connected components, the theory of fields, and they correspond to the characteristics. What happens if you test fields in your favorite coherent axiomatization in other kinds of set theoretic universes? I don't know, but you know, a very simple notion of, uh, of torsor becomes very interesting once you test it in an unusual set theoretic universe. Here's another exercise. This is something that I can do, I promise. So this natural homotopy equivalence, it looks like adjoint functors, but it's not. You have a topos here, you have a topos here. Geometric morphism, geometric morphism. And you take the forward image, of direct image of the geometric morphisms, you get a self-functor here. And this self-functor has to be connected by like a zigzag of natural transformations to the identity. Then you take the direct images the other way around, you get a self-functor of that other thing, and it's got to be connected to the identity by a zigzag of natural equivalences. And the zigzag of natural equivalences can be any length and any shape. So this is not like a logical or category theoretic notion, it's more of, a, of an algebraic topological type. I guess Olivia just solved it, and I hope that the audience also solved this. By the way, I remember that when I was, I know, around 25, I thought that Wow, I have classifying toposes. I'm going to rule the world. I'm going to explain everything in terms of classifying toposes, especially, you know, that I liked logic and I liked algebraic topology, and this is one of the possible passes between the two. You have a theory, classifying topos, it's got algebraic topological invariants. And yes, they do, except they turn out to be trivial, even in cases when you don't want them to be trivial. And you know what you can blame firmly this thing on is that a finite limit theory has a very special kind of classifying topos. Not only is it a P-shift topos, but the underlying indexing category has, depending on your point of view, a terminal or a final object, the, the 
model on the, on the nothing, the initial object, and this is enough. This is enough already to make it naturally homotopy equivalent to the point. It's the same phenomenon that Professor Kahn referred to. If you have a category and it's got either a terminal or an initial object or both, then the classifying, categories, classifying space is contractible. However, if you test this idea on something that's not a finite limit theory, but uses the existential quantifier in a way that's not provably unique, that there's some room there, then you can get interesting things out of it. I've never played with that, but I hope that the audience has or will. So, if you are an algebraic topologist, then this is the most natural thing to expect. You know that simple sure cohomology is representable by simple sure cohomology classes into what are called Eilenberg MacLean simply sure sets constructed by Eilenberg and MacLean, really, really painfully, generators and relations, so that this is going to be true for simple sure sets. And then a bit later, singular cohomology and other kind of cohomology theories were realized to be representable via homotopy classes, that is in the homotopy category, and uh, representing spaces were still called eilenberg maclean spaces. For generalized cohomology theories like K-theory, Bordism, and so on, these representing spaces form a sequence. Together with the connecting map and other data, they make up what is called a spectrum, this is not the spectrum of the algebraic geometers. It's the spectrum of the algebraic topologists. Very little relations between the two. These are the animals that Professor Kahn also referred to as being pretty disgusting. You know, these representing spaces, infinite loop spaces, and so on. I don't think that anyone has seen this for sheaf cohomology. And this is sheaf cohomology, right? Cohomology of a topos. So if you think about sheaf cohomology, how do you compute it? I mean, if you can compute it, injective resolutions. If you want to make it canonical, something like the Godman, you know, standard construction, or acyclic resolutions, or flabby resolutions, derived category, triangulated categories, very involved schemes, and this recipe just doesn't seem to be applicable. So the reason that I just call this a proposition, as if it was nothing, is that, you know, out of the, I know, 10 possible ways to get to sheaf cohomology, there is one way I know of just one way where this thing falls out as an immediate corollary. It's, it's a gift. So this is the Yoneda of the Yoneda lemma. So Nobu Yoneda is immortal for two reasons. I think this is the harder one. It should be like twice as long immortal for the Yoneda extension story. One of the many ways to define X groups, which are, if you like by definition, the same thing as sheaf cohomology groups. And this is a certain kind of combinatorial recipe that you stare at, and it turns out to say exactly the same thing, so the following thing. Take the category of, take a model of a certain geometrically definable theory in your topos, and then quotient out by the morphisms between those models, take a look at the set of equivalence classes, and this is what you're looking for. So first of all, you have to check that this is something which is, so n is fixed, by the way, n is not a variable at all, so the entire shape is fixed. You know what abelian groups are, you know what exactness is, so image, same thing as kernel, and a morphism just means this thing, you know, morphism this way, making a commutative diagram. It's Yoneda himself, it was Yoneda himself who pointed out that zigzag equivalence classes, two extensions, you know, mapping to the third one, is the same thing as any kind of connection between equivalence classes. And so this means that if you are able to construct this classifying topos, and you are, then it's a classifying topos up to natural homotopy equivalence, representing object, for sheaf cohomology. You don't get a very concrete description of this topos, by the way. I don't know a very de concrete description. I mean, you can apply the standard recipes, but I think you get something pretty reasonably involved.
So there's a simplific not a simplification, but a corollary of a long chain of thought, entirely due to Joyal and Wraith, that results in a very different looking description of this classifying topos. Not the same thing, but something that's naturally homotopy equivalent to it. So it's got the same shape up to homotopy theory, but it's not equivalent as a category. And this is the classifying topos of a theory that's in the signature of morphisms of simple short sets. You have to know that these notions are actually axiomatizable, and you have to know that this object is constructible, but they are. And you can push this even further and even further and even further, there are various generalizations. So at the beginning of this talk, I promise you an apple and an orange that become comparable once you blow both of them out to toposes, but not before. So is it the case that an eilenberg maclean topos is the category of sheaves on an eilenberg maclean space? And the answer is no. Is it the case that an eilenberg maclean topos is like a simplicial set, that's an eilenberg maclean simplicial set, turned into a topos? And the answer is no. However, they are comparable, and in fact, there's a comparison morphism that induces isomorphism and cohomology. Not that this is due to me at all, it's Joyal and Wraith. So, this is the apple. It's an eilenberg maclean topos, constructed essentially out of logic, if you like. Out of, a, of an algebraic recipe, but now it's a space. This is a very honest topological space cellular CW complex, realization of a simplicial set, you take sheaves on it. There is a morphism this way, there has to be, because this is a more universal object than this. This is a universal object in a smaller category, this is a universal object in a bigger category, so there has to be such a comparison morphism. And moreover, it induces not just cohomology isomorphisms with arbitrary coefficients, but because there is no fundamental group really, it's got to be a, a pro-weak equivalence so it actually just follows the second paragraph by the work of Artin and Mazur on etal homotopy theory. And then where this development stopped is looking at the final structure of the cohomology ring, if you like here, various connecting maps between eilenberg maclean spaces and see if you can imitate them by various geometric morphisms between these eilenberg maclean toposes, inducing suitable if you like, you know, algebraic or combinatorial or logical descriptions of cohomology operations, and that's still not being done. You can, you can think of that, you know, the Steenrod algebra, and realizing the Steenrod operations in terms of extensions was just a question in homological algebra in the combinatorics of short exact sequences. It is very hard because the Steenrod algebra is exceedingly complicated. So I think this is a, this is a pretty nice analogy. The Hurevich theorem is not so important at this point. It turns out that, you know, this is the same thing as Vergier's truncated hypercovers. This recipe and this recipe is almost the same thing as the definition of the previous lines. This line follows from this. This line follows from this. This is like an outlier. It's just true for its own sake. And this is like an outlier. It's true for a different reason. But I want to say the analogy is big time broken. Here it's isomorphism classes, and here it's homotopy classes. It's equivalence classes of models. So you think about H1, as it happens so often in, in number theory and in algebraic geometry, you love it because it parameterizes isomorphism classes of objects. And of course in number theory also because if it's got a section, it's got a rational point, then it's trivial and all kinds of things. And then H2 and H3 and H whatever, they are just out there. So like, you know, they have definition, but it's not clear that they parameterize isomorphism types of something nice. So for group cohomology with Z coefficients and H2, you can do something. Non-abelian H2, it's, it's its own thing. It's really, really strange. Sorry. <laughs> and then you have group cohomology with Z coefficients and H3, you can do something there. But they don't have the same kind of, I know, natural beauty as H1. And why not? I don't know. But I'd like to make the following conjecture.
So H1 is classified by something whose category of models is always a groupoid. If you have a groupoid, then the notion of connected component and the notion of isomorphism type of object, they are the same. But I want to say that this probably never happens again if you think about classifying spaces which are eilenberg maclean spaces. You can get very close, which is that you are counting equivalence classes of objects that map to the same object and satisfy a calculus of fractions or are connected by a longer zigzag or something. So the intuition behind it is it sort of works in simply short sets in topological spaces. If the following was made any sense, then it would work. So neither line is a, is a statement in itself. This is this statement implying this statement, implying this statement, implying this statement, implying this statement. If this chain of implications worked, that would be the conjecture that I made on the previous slide. For example, so if you have a topos, so that its category of models in any topos has this very funny property one isomorphism type of object in each connected component. This is so rare that I want to say that that sort of means that the category of models of that theory is always a groupoid. And I want to say that this is so rare that F is a Galois topos. Whatever Galois topos means, maybe it's the literal sense of rotundix index definition, maybe a slightly different variant of it. A Galois topos is something whose homotopy groups are or, or in dimension one. This is one way to think about it. So it's a classifying space for dimension one, for H1. It cannot be a classifying space for higher cohomology. And so this is why you are out of luck if you want to classify, if you want to understand higher cohomology groups in such an easy way as you can for H1. So I guess this is the point where I'd like to stop. Thank you.